Uh, how's everybody doing? I am here today with Ken J from Static X. Um, it's a band that I fell in love with. This is sounding awful. 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> you should be on this end of it. Dude, it just hit me. I was like, oh my God. Static X, yeah, you guys have been around since the late 90s. That's 20 years. Yes. 2020 now. Yeah. Um, wow. Still holds up, man. Um, well, it it's still thank you to my ears. It it still uh, sounds just as fresh as ever. Those first couple records that you guys did and stuff like that, the ones that you were involved in, um, and then I mean th this is common news here, and I'm sure I'm probably gonna like retread a lot of topics in, in our chat today that might be common news, but because okay. you and I haven't met before. And I don't really know you. Um, I'm gonna <laughs> probably ask them anyway, and then you know people can comment on YouTube and say this guy doesn't know anything about this band. <laughs> no, it's just I don't know you. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, feel free. You know, it's I mean, it's part of the gig, really. It is yeah to just talk about it and. You know, um, it 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 seemed silly twenty years ago to talk about the things that we kept having to talk about over and over. Right. But at this point, you go, oh, okay, I get it. You know, and not everybody heard that initial stuff. So. Yeah, and it's it's legacy. It's not often that a band can tread the waters and and still keep the ship afloat for as long as you guys have. Uh, especially given the circumstances that you guys have had throughout <laughs> yeah. your, your public history. Um, so we'll probably try to work this a little bit backwards, starting with like the most recent news, because that's coming out of the gate. You guys just put a record out in July, right? Yeah. Came out? Cool. Yep. I'm trying to make sure that I remembered when that was. Um, <laughs> so uh, you guys have put a new record out this year uh that is if i'm if i'm understanding it correctly it's part um recordings and and unreleased material and material that maybe wasn't quite finished yet when wayne was still alive and then part tribute to his legacy like sort of a, a mishmash of the two if that if i'm kind of understanding yeah, probably more. I mean, the the stuff that we had um, was it was demos, and and part of Wayne was a snippet guy, so he would get this, and obviously, you know, our music is repetitious. We kind of based it initially twenty odd years ago. Uh, I mean, obviously, you hear the dance music element of it, <clears throat> and lyrically, we would change it up from verse to verse. But, but simplicity in the guitar parts, you know, and and simplicity overall was was kind of a big deal. I I mean, the big joke amongst the four of us was, it's so stupid it could work. <laughs> you know so um and that was how he would approach demos i've got this little drum program and this guitar part or i have this guitar part and a vocal i'll throw a, a cheesy drum program underneath it and we'll build the song off that um so that's really what we had they weren't there was some stuff I, I would tell you uh, worth dying for was, you know, that was a kind of a fully realized vocal for the most part. Um, some of the verse stuff was missing. And so Zero did that. Cool. Um, so really, I think vocally, I think that we figured out at one point, 45% of it was Wayne vocally. The rest is zero and Tony, obviously. Yep. Um, I mean, the drum programs aren't like 
you know, fully realized parts. And that was something, okay, initially I'm gonna, here's your history lesson on the writing of Death Trip was, you know, we didn't, Wayne and I lived together at that time and we didn't have any money for samplers or any kind of fancy drum machines. Everything was, was new in the early to mid nineties and it was very expensive. And so, but you could get like Alesis uh, HR16B drum machines for 200 bucks. Definitely owned a couple of those in my day. <laughs> exactly. And the thing is, is guess what? Now I'm like downloading it onto my Mac for 40 bucks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but the, but there was something adventurous about we had to be really creative so we had that we had a fostex four track that tony still has actually and a cassette deck so we would no keyboards until we got koichi in the band um and it, wayne and i would sit there with like you know vhs machines and and just build these samples you know, and kind of crazy drum machine patterns. But in regards to the, you know, this is so stupid, it just might work. Um, an example is the the bridge on Push It actually has like a death metal triangle in it. You have to listen to it with headphones. I can go back and re-listen to that. Yeah, you, and and that's the thing is, you know, we're doing it, we're doing the programs, and it's like, that's dumb, leave it in. <laughs> well, most of most of the the music we had, the the ideas I had, the demos were very simple, and so you know, we just kind of took it and ran with it. Uh, I, so. The, the new record is just a collection of these demos that you guys have had kind of sitting around. How, like, how far back did some of those demos go? Were some of those demos 20 years old or were some of them a little more recent? That stuff that Wayne had maybe had laying around or? Well, I know there's three songs that, and I actually, I never heard the original versions. Okay. I heard um, demos that were taken off the original versions but we had a Wayne vocal, a fully realized Wayne vocals. There were three songs that were around the start of war period for the band. Um, and Tony thinks stuff like Worth Dying For, uh, there's three or four songs Tony thinks that maybe uh, they were around Shadow Zone era okay. because Wayne was, he, he had gone, you know, when I met him in 89, I mean, he was a singer and he had a goth band and I was the metalhead kid and we influenced that way and became this dance music band. But he always kind of had that kind of like voice think of a better term I guess you would say and um so the, there was stuff where you know during the shadow zone era um you know that was supposed to be the the make or break album for the band and and um so it was a little more commercial and the vocals were a little more accessible than the first couple of albums. And so, so yeah, Tony thinks that those, there's a few, uh, some stuff from that era. Okay. Well, because well, I listened to it recently and I, it didn't seem like it really missed a beat from those first two records. It almost felt like the third one in the deck, that the one that should have come after Machine, you know? I and and you know I I I uh, really appreciate that. I really thought, I mean, we had the demos and everything. 
you know, the weird thing was, was when we initially toured with Death Trip, mm -hmm. you know, that was almost three years of touring. And then we got off the road. Koichi quit the band even before we started working on stuff for Machine. So it it felt like everything changed then and that, and that we, there was another album like those first two that kind of combined them. Yeah, the, I mean, that was, I'll, I'll admit that my knowledge of, of the material after those first two is probably very limited. Um, those first two, hit me at the right age i was in high school you know what i mean um I yeah on the machine tour actually um really where sure i still have one of wayne's guitar picks in a collection of stuff in my house and, <laughs> uh and it so after that is is kind of when my own career started moving forward i guess so it's almost like you started to listen to less new music because you were always focusing on the stuff you had to do. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean, and um, and so I I know I've heard songs off of uh, the other albums and stuff like that here and there, but honest, off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you which one came at, off of what album or what year. Um, but those first two, like I still own them and I still revisit them once in a while when I'm feeling nostalgic and stuff like that. <laughs> and so, um, knowing that you guys had the new one coming out this year with, you know, the, the classic lineup kind of thing. Um, I was like, Oh, I'm, I'm curious to hear what they do with what, with what this whole project is, is becoming with the tour you guys did last year and stuff like that. Um, I was super curious about it. So I was like, well, I got to listen to it. So I did. And I was like, this, this, it sounds like what should have been the next record after machine, you know, to my ears. Anyway, there was even some of the, like some of the drum samples that you were talking about. There was one song in there and I'm, I'm blanking on what it is now. It's third or fourth song in on the record where I actually stopped when I was listening to it. I was like, Man, that sounds like a super old school drum machine. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean, Alex, you're uh, you know, mentioning that the Alesis SR15 or whatever. 16B. 16. Um, yeah. I'm, now it makes sense. So I was like, ah, so it probably was samples like that. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I appreciate it. I loved it. I love old cheesy samples. It's the one reason that I won't upgrade my electronic drum set that I have. Um, because the new stuff is starting to sound better and better and better. And I oh, have, it's fantastic. I have a super old Yamaha electronic drum set from 15 years ago, and I love how fake and cheesy the sounds are on it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you don't understand. That's the sound I want. If I'm going to be using electronic drums on something, that's the sound I want is electronic drums. I don't want it to yeah. sound like this. <laughs> it's kind of like... I appreciate when 80s bands go on the road now and, and play their hits and everything, but some of those old bands, you hear them, and you know the drummer was playing like a Simmons kit or he had Simmons pads, and you you hear it on modern acoustic drums. You're like, oh my gosh, it sounds fantastic. I don't like it. <laughs> so funny you brought that up because that literally was happened to me yesterday where i've got to learn a song um this this band that i'm playing with um they wanted to throw a, a couple covers in the set at some event we have coming up and it's like i don't really like doing covers but okay one of the songs is like one of those super 80s simmons kick kind of drum songs and, I'm, and there's so many overdubs. I'm like, well, I don't have four arms. How do I accomplish this? So I'm trying to pull out the, the identifiable parts of like, if I play that and I do a crossover here or whatever. And I was like, you know what? Let me just watch the band do it and see what they do. So I went and I looked them up on YouTube. And all of the videos that showed up are from the last 10 years. I couldn't find anything <laughs> from the 80s. They were all from the last 10 years. And it's exactly like you said. The drummer's yeah. playing a regular modern acoustic set. He's playing just the simple backbeat and all of the bells and whistles stuff that you hear the, the Simmons drums. 
keyboard player mm-hmm. and ate all of it. And I was like, oh, oh man. Well, that well, doesn't me. <laughs> the other thing too, you know, um, I remember when, and you know, one of my one of my favorite bands, well, and one of a huge influence on Static X on all four of us. We loved prom. I mean, prom was just brutal. <laughs> you know, they were so great. You know, and oh, I'm a I'm a huge Ted Parsons fan. You know. And Prong's just one of those bands. They've had, you know, a few drummers since Ted. And every one of them is great. But I can't hear Prong with hearing that D4 type sound from <laughs> Beg to Differ, you know, that, that kind of gated D4 sound. Um, and, you know, modern triggers are so good. When we, when we, and when we toured with Megadeth in 99, um, uh, oh my gosh, now <laughs> uh, Jimmy DeGrasso was playing for us. Okay. And Jimmy DeGrasso, he had this really great Pearl Masters custom. I mean, just a great kit. And he internally mic'd it, but he also used to use like a, a DM5 with it so he had this really cool sound and you know just by flipping a few knobs he could go either way with it but he 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 had a rounded sound and it worked for me but when i hear something that's supposed to be triggered or a simmons kit or something like that like the whole um i've been going through and watching old you know Terry Bozio videos and and you know everything used to be roto toms for him oh, yeah. and now I hear a modern acoustic kit and I'm like eh. <laughs> I, I like the authenticity I, I like it just <laughs> you know if you're playing a song that was recorded 30 years ago I kind of like it to sound like it did I mean you know, it's like you said it it sounds big it sounds epic it sounds great but it doesn't oh. the same as what I heard on the radio on my way to the show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, and, and it's kind of weird in a sense, you know? Um, I don't know, but, but I, well, I'm just, I'm like you, I, th- I think I'm a more creative um, from a programming standpoint. You know, I can sit down for hours on the computer and just go through sample after sample and just listen. And I find myself, okay, I have not worked at all, but I've listened to 2000 samples, you know, and they all sound great and I have nowhere to start. So then I just have to reduce it to, I like this cheesy sound. So I'm going to do that. Uh, my electric kit is, um, I got one of the first Roland V drum kits. Mm-hmm. And we actually, I used it to record um, machine on, and then we flew in my live sounds. All right, well, all right. So that brings up an, uh, an interesting point that I would wanted to ask you anyway. And I, I kind of ask everybody who, anybody who do, does anything with music that is heavy on the electronic side of things, I, I'm always got to dig into the drummer's brain a little bit and be like, all right, how much on on the recordings how much is programmed versus how much is real um and then how are you translating that live is it just tracks or are you using triggers all kinds of stuff so you so when you recorded you said machine it was on your yeah yeah well and so so both those first two albums Mm -hmm. were and you'll, you'll love this story and this is a great drummer's story Okay. Um, but it's more of a great Koichi Fukuda story, our, our guitarist. So in uh, 97 was when that was when we found out we were going to get signed. And I, I believe, um, I can't remember, I think it was in the fall. 
and the guy who was going to sign us, you know, we were going through, we didn't go through a bidding process or anything. This guy, you know, had heard about the band, came and saw us mm -hmm. and um, got really excited. We met with him a couple of times. And then like, a, you know, just the weekend before we were supposed to get signed, he stood up at his desk, took his keys off his keychain, and flipped everybody off as he walked down the hall and quit. Okay. So um, while all the shuffling was going on, you know, for it took about like eight to 10 months for us to actually sign our recording contract. And management at the time was like, look, we know you guys want to play and, and you've been doing many tours and everything, but, you know, we think of it as you're kind of giving away your music in that sense. So we don't want you to tour as much, um, just play some local shows, select local shows, more high profile. And so, you know, after years of trying to get this thing built up and working really solid for two, two and a half years, all of a sudden it's, okay, well, we'll play once a month, but you know, we're gonna play a Roxy show, but it's gonna be once a month. So Koichi, we decided to go ahead and record my drums. And Koichi had a, a Mac SE computer, which is like the one, I think it had like a, a nine inch screen and it only, it only came, you know, the colors were black and green. Yeah. That was it. Oh, it yeah. was like, it was like Joshua from War Games. <laughs> and um, so we took that, Koichi went to Radio Shack and bought $20, $22 worth of electrical parts. He cut <laughs> plywood that fit perfectly inside my my rims. And he built homemade triggers to go into his Mac SE. No way. Yeah. Oh my God. Now the deal was is, you know, we had we had micro, I don't know why we didn't think of it at the time, but but what we did well and so each night after practice, we would, you know, record a song. So essentially my drums were done a few months before we record started recording death trip but um we kept having to go at you know the mac would crash and we would lose everything i mean we couldn't just the same features weren't great but um but we got it to work so you know my first day in the studio when we recorded death trip was getting samples and also miking up cymbals because while we had triggers for everything else, it was like, well, you know, we really, live cymbals are the way to go. And especially at that time, there's, you know, the, the sampling rates have gotten so much better. So, the, you know, the old decay rates on cymbals used to be squared off so much that they, you could tell they were fake. Yeah. So, I recorded, we muted my drums and set up overheads and we recorded my cymbals in the studio a few months. And there's a, uh, if you watch, Ulrich has done a couple of these producer shows, Ulrich Wild, mm -hmm. and he said, you know, Ken got the pleasure of playing the album twice. Well, for me, it wasn't, I didn't think of it that way. It's only once because I played the same thing, you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I had to, I played all my drum parts into the Mac SE. We um, sampled in the studio. I had bought a new drum kit by that time, sampled all my new drums in the studio, flew those into the Mac SE stuff, and then I played live cymbals over it. We did roughly the same kind of thing on machine, except by then I had an electric kit and we had, you know, um, some pretty good live sounds that we had used. Plus I wanted to, for a machine, I'm a pretty big Stuart Copeland fan. Mm -hmm. And so I really, I love the drum sound on Ghost in the Machine. It's just such a great drum sound. 
and I kind of wanted to not to copy it, but you know, what would that sound like with what we're doing? You know, that to me sonically just kind of fit and and already got that, you know. I didn't specifically tell them, oh, I'm looking for the ghost in the machine drum sound, but but yeah, I had a, I got the the T D eight or ten, I can't remember. T D eight. Yeah, oh yeah, that's that's old school. <laughs> yeah. Mesh heads. Yeah. Uh, had the separate, you know, the actual kick drum mm -hmm. okay. for yeah. it. Um, I had to learn, you know, how to set velocity settings really quick and everything, but uh, it worked really well. That's that's pretty crazy. I didn't see that. That was something that I was always curious about, especially, like I said, with that kind of music of like how much of it is someone in a studio doing it versus how much of it is someone behind a computer doing it and where's the balance, what's being used, what isn't, because so many records nowadays too are, are being done with program drums. And the, like you yeah. said, the sampling gets so good now that a lot of the time you can't even tell. There's people I've talked to where I was like, oh, who played the drums on this? And they're like, uh, easy drummer. <laughs> like, sounds so good, you know? Man, that easy drummer is great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah, because the 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 audio samples have just gotten so good. So I'm always curious of like, all right, right how much is a human? How much is actually somebody in a studio behind a kit, and how much of it isn't? Um, so it's it's just something that's always fascinated me, and it was something specifically that I wanted to ask you about because um, that's that kind of music, and there's stuff on those records that I've listened to where I was like, can't be dude, can't be real. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and like, there no, that's is totally playable. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, uh, trust me, that was, you know, we had a moment. I remember one time Wayne and I had a moment where we were like, do we need to pay a percussionist to come out to play Death Metal Triangle? <laughs> and then you're like, well, no. But even then, you know, at one point we had, when we were still a local band, we had, and we had switched to a DA-38 at that point. They hadn't come out with 88s yet, but we had a, a single 38 and so we switched all of our, you know, programming and samples and stuff to that. But Koichi still played keyboards live and he had, he had built this, uh, kind of keyboard stand on a cart and we were playing a Roxy show and matter of fact it might have been the show where we announced we got signed at and um, some dude kind of was crowd surfing and basically landed on Koichi's keyboard so you know the day after that we were like yeah eh, maybe we put that on the 38s now you know? <laughs> And and so and then we read about I believe it was Nine Inch Nails. Uh, once the eighty eights came out, and they do, they do a lot of stuff live. I mean, they have a lot more people on stage and stuff. And and you know we considered doing that, but but it was really about you know the actual live drums, bass, and guitar mm -hmm. and vocals for us. So um, we just, you know, we went to the 88s. We bought two of them. We used one as a slave. We had them synced. And so if one went down, it all automatically flipped to the other. In regards to the programming stuff, you know, we always used programming was a writing tool. Mm -hmm. um, and I wrote a lot of lyrics. And, we, and especially when Wayne and I lived together, you know, we would sit down, we didn't sit, but prior to becoming Static X when we were just drums, bass and guitar, well, then we were in the practice space and, and we were working on parts together. Once we started adding the programming, then we would focus more on samples, guitar parts, keys, you know, what we could get out of Koichi. 
And then oddly enough, it, it was a little strange in the sense where the drums weren't as foundational. They were for specific songs like Sweat of the Bud, because the idea was, what if it, what if we did a disco song with a stupid beat kind of fast, you know? Um, and so then, you know, because of the joking aspect, well, sure, yeah, let's do this. But, um, you know, and probably Wisconsin Death Trip too. That was another one where the drums and the programming were almost together from the start and we went on from there. But it wasn't, I just decided not to have an attitude about it and to let the song dictate what I played. And, and you know, we were kind of a, we, everything was simple. The programming can work on its own and the band can work on its own. And it's, it's interesting and we just made it fit together. Cool, man, that's very cool. Yeah, it's, there's so many different ways to do it now too. And um, so many different ways of like accomplishing the end result. Like, all right, so you, you did yours where you did the, the drums, basically, like you said, almost like doing it twice. You recorded the cymbals, you recorded yeah. you got samples out of your kit, you were play, basically played the first record on plywood. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, some people are like going strictly program drums on the record, and then they have somebody else just duplicate it live. That's like, honestly, probably 80% of the work I've done in the last 10 years is just learning, going on stage, having... Okay what someone did this to instead yeah. of actually play you know and um and even with like having the samples live and stuff like that too um a lot of people are, are not using like the big rack mount processors and stuff anymore they're i mean they're using yeah that, you know yeah exactly i did a show last week this was our keyboard player <laughs> <laughs> you know um, <laughs> Cause you can get away with it now yeah exactly when it when it came to live like you said obviously you're having um samples being triggered live so you're playing to the click and stuff like that on stage mm -hmm. but did you do anything different to your drums is it were you using triggers on your drums too to capture sounds or were you going straight acoustic live i am i i went straight acoustic um i'm not for me there's enough in the programming that is processed. Now, now the thing is, I I wanted a really good drum sound, and and oddly enough, that was you know how at the time in the '90s that was kind of how I got my Pearl endorsement was I had I had always wanted a Pearl export, you know, and I had played um, you know my first drum set was an early '60s Rogers. And then I had a, um, a uh, like an 82 Rogers kit, big oversized Tom and everything. Mm -hmm. But I, I'd always wanted, you know, Pearl Exports since they came out. Those so nice. Those, those late 80s ones and even the ones into the 90s, those were nice kits. There was, they were really cool. Well, in those, those 80 ones, you know, those were, those were heavy duty drums. Those were, you know, they, they all weighed a ton. The, the tension, you know, they had that long tension rod thing. Yeah, exactly. Like these. That, <laughs> I tend exactly. And, and have you ever taken one apart? Yeah, I, I got a <laughs> snare drum. Uh, I got a marching snare recently that um, I refinished. I bought it off eBay for a ridiculously dumb, stupid, cheap price. <laughs> and um, the finish on it was, was all scuffed up and stuff like that. So I was, I decided to refinish it and it has the high tension lugs on it. Nice. So I just took it apart like a couple months ago and, and yeah, it's a little crazy inside. That. <laughs> yes. They're absolutely crazy. Well, and, and, you know, so exports originally were just these, you know, 
big deep drums and oversized and then you know the 90s happened and everybody started going to smaller drums again but kind of deep kick drums mm -hmm. and you know with the the heavier rock scene kind of coming back again in the late 90s pearl was like well you know let's put out an export again so i didn't have a deal with them but i went to guitar center after we got our first publishing check i had never had a brand new drum set and at the time i was playing like a 70 or 71 Ludwig custom jazz. It was kind of, it looked like the Ringo kit. It was Marine Oyster Pearl, but it was all oversized. Oh. It was a, tw yeah, 24 by 24 by 16 kick, uh, 13 and 14 inch rack toms. They weren't, they were like nine and 10 inch. They weren't yeah. really deep, but it also had two floors. Um, I just went with single rack tom, but uh, I was also using a Tama Piccolo snare. Uh, and in the 90s, everyone was rocking those Piccolo snares. Uh, well, and that was the thing. I blew it. I blew it. I exploded it. <laughs> I, actually, I had it torqued up so much and I had switched. I had gone over to, I hadn't gotten an Evans endorsement yet, but I was using, I had switched from Remos to Evans and was putting on an Evans. And and granted, I mean, I'd had a lot of, uh, I'd had several years on that Tama, um, but yeah, I, I I just shredded it. I just <laughs> pop. Okay, well, I probably shouldn't do that. <laughs> I, uh, but um, I think they're coming. I, I think the, yeah. the Piccolo era was like definitely that late '90s, early 2000s, new metal kind of thing. And then mm -hmm. started getting away from it and started getting deeper and deeper snares again. But I feel like it's coming back. I like I I got a piccolo that I borrowed from a producer for a session a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. and I've tried to give it back to him like three or four times. And every time I go, <laughs> no, dude, I still have that snare. And he's like, I don't need it, just whatever. I've used it on like four records this year alone. <laughs> because it's like, oh, you know what? The snare needs a little extra snap on this song. Better bust out that piccolo again. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, and and that's the thing I, I use. Um, well, and the the weird story was when I blew up <laughs> the Tama. That was when I decided. Well, heck with it. I got my our first publishing check, you know, and I was like, time for a new drum set. Yeah, I need a new snare drum. Let's go ahead and buy a new kit. Well, um, I went to Guitar Center on Hollywood and I ordered custom a custom size uh, export. It was like 800 bucks, um, 24 by 18 kick, uh, 14 by, like <laughs> a 14 by 11 tom. I mean, my rack tom was huge. Floor tom. <laughs> it was almost a floor tom. Well, and my floors were 16 and 18s, and, and they were, you know, really deep. But, oh, and I got the standard um, 5 by 14 snare. And, um, you know, s s standard steel body. But I, and I wanted attack, but I, I wanted a little more overtone but not much you know our music is so fast that i didn't and muddy if it I, didn't have an, if it had too much ring to it it would probably just get muddy if it on those it, it yeah it would get muddy and you know the next snare hit would kind of chop it and but i still you know i'm a 70s kiss fan so you know peter chris had those steel bodied snares that just you know boom i mean they were just king of overtone so um i got that but i switched to i switched to evans heads and i i started using active strainers the rhythm tech active strainers i've seen that is that the one that, that's like in a housing kind of thing yeah All right, yeah so i've 
I mean, I've seen those my entire life. I've never actually used one. What, what do they do? Like, what's the benefit of it? Well, uh, for me, it because of the housing, it it keeps the your snares on the. It keeps the strainer on the bottom head um, a little more firmly and a little more. You don't get any kind of side to side play. The 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 downside to it is if you tighten it too much, um, it just acts like a mute. Oh yeah, it would so choke it. Yeah, but um, the other thing I liked about it, I mean, we toured so much that my thought process behind it was, hey, what well, this way I won't be replacing strainers all the all the time and i had one that lasted for five or six years uh and we toured that whole time um and the other one which was on my backup snare i i broke it right before we started touring on project or on last year and so i had to replace it i, keep, I always keep a couple of them around i just liked active strainers but there's so many new, you know, they've got those quick release ones with the pins now. I can't remember who makes those. Absolutely. I use those on the kits, you know, my kits around here that I practice on. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, on tour, I use the active strainers. But I, I ended up getting my Pearl endorsement. I mean, uh, John Tempesta helped, helped me first and introduced me to the guys and and the pro guys came out to a show in um, in Nashville in, I think it was the fall of 99, we were playing a a oh, JT did that, but he's a Tama guy. What's he doing mixing and matching here? And <laughs> I, I had my, well, that's, he knew, he knew um, my A&R guy at Pearl. Oh, okay. One of his best friends, he's like, I know you're not a Tama guy, <laughs> but I'll introduce you to these guys. So he introduced me, me to them, or he gave me their numbers. Okay. Um, he was with, you know, he was with Rob Zombie at the time. And um, so, but I didn't meet those guys for another like month, month and a half. And um, uh, yeah, JT's one of my favorite drummers of all time Dude, i love that guy he was he was the guy that i literally had posters of on my bedroom wall <laughs> high school i had like i had him and i had lars and i had joey kramer from aerosmith and that was like uh, wallpaper in my room when i was in high school you know and yeah. john's a great guy he and i have gotten to be friends over the years and stuff like that and which is i felt very very fortunate that we met we met after a Rob Zombie show it had to be like, you know, 2000 or 2001 or something like that. And we've been was... friends ever since kind of thing. <laughs> right. Well, and he, uh, you know, um, Astro Creep was a huge influence on the band. I, I was a huge fan then we go out on tour with them, and we were the same management company anyway. Um, and we knew we knew Mikey Tempesta. You know, Mike had played for, yeah, and Mike had played. He'd been in uh, Human Waste Project, and that was when we met him. And then you know he was in Power Man when we toured with them. And uh, so yeah, then you know I get to meet Tempesta. And that, I mean, Tim, he's just such a great guy. And so he, he introduced me to them and Pearl came out to a club date and like, I think we were out with Fear Factory, but it was a night off. So we played a, a club show in, in Nashville and the guys came out to the show and they were, they were like, okay, what kind of triggers are you using? And, and I was like, man, I don't even have, there's no muffling. I don't believe in i don't put pillows in my drums or tape on the heads you that's know, just my tune the kick you don't have a pillow in your kick no i have a i have an evans eq pad okay. that i cut the but i cut the ends off and really? now i have a we use a sure beta yeah in my kick drum yeah 
Yeah. And um, and actually, we had started. We had a sure of. I wish I remember if it was a '98, but they, you know, they had the beta model. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, 90, yeah. Is that a beta '91? I think. I think that's it. I remember it's the it's like about this big. It's flat, kind of. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah, kind of, kind of built up a little bit. Only, okay. but only love those microphones, you know. But yeah, I I clipped the ends off of the EQ pad. Of, you know, put in the Velcro, mm -hmm. put that in there. No way. The one thing I do, I I am guilty. I I've, I've actually, and people kill me for this, but. It doesn't matter because the drum set got stolen anyway. Um, I, you know, I drill holes through the bottom of the kit of the kick drums for to hide all my lines for the microphones. We just run run the wires through the kick drum. Ah, okay. You never, yeah. you never just fed it out the the hole in the front or the sound. Part. No, that doesn't look cool to me. <laughs> all right. Well. <laughs> Because <laughs> uh, on my kits that I play live with, I use um, uh, a Shure uh, uh, Beta 52, the big right. one. I use those, but I have them mounted inside on one of those. Um, the uh, snake? No, mic? The, the May system. It oh, looks, yeah. It's like an arm that's adjustable at, with joints yeah. that you use like an Allen wrench on. And you just mount that to like the inside screws of one of the legs of your bass drum. You take mm -hmm. the screws out, put that on, put the screws back in, and it holds the arm there. But for the cable, uh, you can buy this uh, attachment cable that feeds right through like the air vent on top of the drum. Yeah. It plugs right into the mic. And I use that so it's just like an XLR jack on top of the kick. And you just plug mm -hmm. it in there. And it's usually hidden enough by the shadows of your toms and ride and stuff that no one's going to see it yeah um, well and and i have done that uh and i mean we you know i've toured enough that we kind of did a little bit of everything okay um but yeah i like the i like that may setup you're talking about and yeah. also they they've got that new suspension the system i really shoe i got a lot of friends that use that thing it's the, the horseshoe one yeah i like the idea of it because it does suspend the mic and it's kind of shock mounted in there mm -hmm. uh the only thing that's kind of turned me off is, is like it looks so intimidating and complicated because it like <laughs> spider web inside your kick and I'm like, oh my god i'm I just know myself and I know how like anal retentive and how symmetrical I like things to be. And I know I'm going to yeah. cut one of those wires short and it's going to be lopsided. The mic's going to hang. <laughs> you know, and that's honest to God. The only reason I haven't gotten one of those is I'm installing it. <laughs> well, and that was all kidding aside. I'm a little OCD myself. So I did use you know, and and especially when we were a club band, used to cut my own mic holes and everything and put the reinforcement on yeah. and would do all that stuff. And then when we got to the point where I like, I can't personally use the system that I was talking about because, you know, now, I mean, we take everything down every night and it goes into a case um you know back in 99 2000 we were on, on a lot of tours where it'd be you know quite a few bands so you would share a semi mm -hmm. and um like for extreme steel and family values um and the tours after that into into 2002 um my drums just stayed up on the riser. We just oh, covered them every night. Did the forklift with the and took the riser and put it right in the back of the truck kind of thing. Well, that was the thing is what I designed. I had my last riser built, and it was two piece. It was a eight by eight deck. Um, but it was it was two piece. So I had casters built all the way around it, locking casters, and it just uh 
an Allen key, a huge Allen key, and you just pop that thing out. And yeah, my drum tech would, he would take down my rack tom, mm -hmm. slide my throne and my snare over, throw tarps over everything, and then we just rolled onto the truck. That's awesome. <laughs> what a luxury that is. That was, um, Family Values is when I saw you too. Um, oh. That when you guys did it with uh, Stone Temple Pilots. Yeah. That yeah. was a, such a great tour. That that was an insane show and it, just an insane lineup too because it was like Stained and Lincoln Park and they were still like just kind of coming up touring on their first records I think and then you had Stone Temple Pilots as like the legacy band of like we've been here for the last 15 years and we have yeah. all the platinum and you know um, <laughs> yeah. that right before that was like right before they broke up for the first time too um, yeah yeah that that was a great show that was a great tour um, where did you where did you see it at I saw it I grew up in Buffalo New York so I oh. saw it at the hockey arena that we have there. yeah which is also an amazing venue and really great backstage and everything like that that they have there, which is really nice. We, do, we did an interview there that was, it was in the press booth. Oh, so it was, it was at the top of, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, the, and it just, um, I've been in Bridgestone Arena in Nashville. I've never played it, but I went there for a hockey game. And it, it kind of reminded me like the Sabres arena, mm -hmm. like it just, I was up a little bit and I was watching the hockey game and I was, and it kind of, I had a flashback to, you know, family values to her in 2001 and doing that interview and looking down and it just, it seemed like there wasn't a bad seat in the place. It just was amazing. They, they built that place in the mid nineties um, to replace our old arena, which had been around for however many decades and when they designed it it was like it was so that every seat was good we had one of the the brand new jumbotrons which fell and crashed on the ice um oh. and, then, <laughs> and then and then they put another one in which is great <laughs> but no it's a great arena and i i mean i haven't been there in, in over a decade because i've been living here in la but um mm -hmm. man it was such a good venue and i got to play there once before i moved to LA and and got to that's see cool I played actually now that I'm thinking about it oh my god I played hockey there and I played <laughs> <drums> there <laughs> I, just I just realized that uh, one for each thing that I loved because uh, um, I grew up playing ice hockey too how long have you lived in Los Angeles um I am uh just over 11 years at this point oh okay so I've been I've been well, here a while <laughs> it's um it's an unusual city <laughs> <laughs> it just you know like one of the last times i flew out i stay with tony okay. when i'm out there where, uh, where do you live you're not here i'm actually in in east central illinois i'm about oh, an hour and a half yeah i'm right on the illinois indiana border Mm -hmm. uh hour and a half south of chicago hour and a half west of indianapolis okay yeah so um but that's i grew up small town illinois mm -hmm. um my my parents live here and and they're older and you know just getting older I, somebody's got to take care of them and i figure you know for all of the mess that I put them through when I was a teenager and, <laughs> you know, I'm going to be a rock star. Uh -huh. <laughs> I figured that I, it would be more than okay of me to come back and, and help out where I can, you know. No, that's, um, that's nice. Yeah, well, and, you know, Los Angeles, I'm, I, uh, I'm 54 years old, you know, I'm, I moved back here when I was oh 44 mm -hmm. uh, and it, it just I think if I if I was 44 now you know I'd be somewhat more inclined to be in in Los Angeles more but um, you know for me at this age 
you know, we're, we're as a band, we're making it work. And, and uh, you know, I miss riding my motorcycle 11 months of the year. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> to this area. So, yeah, and that's, and it's, uh, it's a draw for Los Angeles. It's, that was um, the, it, one of the big linchpins and why I decided to move here is was like, oh, I don't have to shovel anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely well and the year i moved back in in 2010 and and i i came i left the day i left los angeles it was 87 degrees and by the time i got to i was driving like a 24 foot box truck you know had all my drums and stuff in it my motorcycle everything and I actually had to stop in Las Cruces, New Mexico for three days um, because there was an ice storm that went from like oh. Amarillo clear up to Chicago or oh, something. God. So I had to, yeah, I had to wait for three days. And generally you can, if you push a little hard, like you can, you can do Las Cruces to where I live in a day. Had to stop in Little Rock, Arkansas. Like there was so much ice. Oh my God. That, yeah, you know, so I'm not, I deal with the cold, but I'm like you, it's it's not my favorite thing. <laughs> <laughs> I leave here tonight, when we're done talking, I'm gonna go home. I, I can walk outside like this and I don't have to put a jacket <laughs> now and it's, you know, late October. So, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or when this actually yeah. goes online, it'll be early November because it'll be a couple of years. <laughs> uh, well, I probably still won't need a jacket yet. <laughs> or a light one. You may need a light one. Maybe a light you're getting some wind. Then, but, you know, I probably won't have to bust the leather out at least until January. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, there you go. Yeah. It's I'm I'm I miss that about it. I'm I'm outside a lot. I work out a lot and I'm working on a I'm remodeling a house now and I've got the thing gutted. Okay. So, you know, I don't have a heater or an air conditioner in that thing. And it's it that's also where my weight room is and it's brutal, right? Oh my God. <laughs> Gotta get in there and just start doing as many curls as you can right out of the gate. Just <laughs> yeah. up. Oh um, well, I, I have, I, I highly recommend to every drummer um, get into boxing. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So I do like between six to 10 minutes of warm up on the speed bag. Mm hmm. I can get a pretty good sweat going. Then I'm okay. But otherwise, yeah, it's like you said. I'm either, I'm either on. I've got an old Schwinn Aerodyne. I'm either warming up on that for a few minutes or doing the speed bag because it oh cold. Oh, I, I can only imagine. I have mm -hmm. like I went back uh, and visited my family for the holidays last year, and the winter wasn't too bad, but it was still enough where it's like. I walked out of the airport and I was like, what is this about? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and and just a heads up, whenever you decide to to move back, if you go back. Let's not say, um, let's say if and probably not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, w I would just say that um, you never get over I I I thought it was such a a superficial thing that I loved Los Angeles so much for the weather, mm -hmm. but I'll admit I'm still not over it. <laughs> I still miss that. I you know it was very it was enjoyable. It was you know how long were you here? Uh, pretty close to twenty years. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, maybe 16, 17 around in that, that that's area. That's pretty significant. That's that's digging some roots in there. Um, yeah. You mentioned like sort of briefly in passing and it kind of jogged my memory. I was like, oh, that did happen recently. 
uh, a kit that got stolen. You guys had, um, you guys lost a bunch of equipment a couple of months ago, right? Yeah. Um, uh, we lost all, almost all Koichi and Tony. Koichi, Tony, and Zero had their guitars. Okay. Um, I lost, well, in the, the kit that I lost, it wasn't so much the kit, but I had it, I had it recovered. That was actually half of the machine tour uh, double kick. Oh, cool. I mean, well, yeah. It's cool and, that it's gone. It's just, I mean, that was a cool drum set is what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I, I had it, I had it recovered in the Chrome. Okay. Um, and professionally recovered. And, um, but the, the rack, I had gotten the rack and I, I customized that all myself. I chopped it up, you know, my drum tech and I, I mean, we really tweaked on that rack to get everything set for two or two or three weeks. And I, I had it down and it, it was more the work yeah, that put all that went into it. In. And was yeah. it, I mean, I don't know how many drum sets you own, but was it, was it just like one kit did, or did you lose a cut more than one? Well, I've still got the other uh, 24 by 18 kick drum. Okay. I still have, I still have the, the 14 inch rack tom from it. That was a 13 I was using. And I'm, you know, I kind of want to go, you know, a little smaller with my rack tom anyway, because that was deep. That was, it was a 13 by 12, I think, or 13 by 13. It was a crazy size. Yeah, that's pushing some air. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, I've only got, I've got a little, um, remember back around, I think it was 2002 or 2003, Pearl did the, the anniversary model export. The black one had black hardware. Uh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, they only did like 275 of them. Well, I, I have one of those that I teach on and I still have the death trip export, which it needs recovering. It needs some work, um, but, and I've got a, you know, I've got my, Still have my first Rogers. Oh, got wow. another Rogers snare drum. I'm just, you know, I'm a 54 year old drummer, so I got a lot of junk. <laughs> got a lot of stuff. I hear you. But yeah, and, and oh. it happens. And and I've gotten rid of a few drum sets and mm -hmm. racks and stands, you know. But the one there were a couple of things. I mean, we lost everything, LED panels, just, but the, the things that bothered me, my, my Pearl snare drums were, they were, I believe the prototypes for what became the Ultracast snare drums, mm -hmm. but they weren't what eventually came out. So I had these first two snare drums that were kind of unusual. They were a little bit deeper. They were like six inch by 14s and um they weighed a ton i mean you know they were because it was i can't remember what the outer shell was i think it was aluminum or carbon but then it, it was wood lined and they were unique huh. uh it was you know they i think they've done other signature models since then and everything that have been really cool but they were planning on putting out the ultra cast was going to be that but then uh, you know it was a little bit pricey so what they eventually came out was you know roughly 380 bucks and i think you can buy ultra cast now they have one that's you know it's just wood with a covering so it's a it's a 80 or 90 dollar snare drum still you know still a drum I like, but nothing like these prototypes I had, and they're gone. <laughs> and also I had, just to show the guys, uh, Wayne, I've got one of Wayne's 
uh, Gibson V's from the Goff V's from the Death Trip era. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a, a Roland tuner, just a little Roland, and it had Wayne's handwriting on it and the tuning for C, which is what we were tuning to back when we were writing Death Trip. And, you know, it was in his handwriting. And so I wanted to show Koichi and Tony, hey, I got the so I showed it to him and threw it in my toolbox. Well, my toolbox is gone. So, oh. <laughs> so stuff like that. And, and it, I mean, you know, from a retail standpoint, you may get five or 10 bucks out of it. But the, the nostalgia part for me was what really, you yeah. know, and the, those prototype snare drums, they're unique to me. But... No, it's hard. It's your stuff. Yeah, no, but it, it's it's heartbreaking. And and uh, when I when I first heard about it, um, a friend of mine on Facebook had posted about it, who I think must be like a mutual friend of ours or something like that. Because the first thing I said is, where is their storage place? Because if there's a break in. <laughs> I'm in this room right here with all my stuff. And I'm like, I, I exactly. Because it said it was like in the San Fernando Valley. And I was like, that's where mine is. So <laughs> I, I wrote my friend. And I was like, hey, where was Static X's stuff? And she's like, I'll find out. I don't know. And she talked to somebody. I, I'm not sure who. Um, maybe it was you. Um, <laughs> and uh, just told me like relatively the area that it was. And I was like half. I was like relieved. Okay, that's not where I am, but also like, wow, that sucks because you guys, um, that was you and dope. You guys shared all your stuff. In that yeah. Place. Like, has there yeah. been any leads at all? Has there been any, I sound stupid. Like I'm on a cop TV show, any leads, but like, no, has there been any word at all of anything surfacing? Well, the, we got our, our sound guy got his, his mixing con console back. Oh, good. Um, yeah. And uh, I think that was it. Because we, we actually did a show in July in Ringle, Wisconsin. Outdoor show, socially distanced. Mm -hmm. um, so, and my drum tech lives in Ohio. So he just drove one of his backup kits for me to use for that. And I practiced, um, you know, on a kit and not my kit in Los Angeles, but yeah, drum wise, I haven't heard anything. It's been a while since I've really asked the guys about it, but <laughs> it does sound, I think I said the same thing you did though, which is, are there any leads, you know, don't yeah. they have, you know, and you think of you, in this world, I mean, Everything's got a camera around it. Well, you know, there are cameras everywhere. Sometimes but, that can even help. Uh, not long after what happened to you guys, uh, another buddy of mine, same exact thing happened to him. And they caught it on camera. And I saw the footage. Like, he posted the footage all over social media so people would be aware of it. Of people, mm -hmm. like, they... they someone had the gate code to his building and they let the gate open and Ugh. the car came in and they went right in and they broke into the van and took all the equipment out and they caught it on camera and they still had trouble getting cooperation from law enforcement and still um, haven't really had anyone surface anything and it, you just got to scratch your head and you're like these people that are stealing all this music equipment what are they doing with it? Is it just piling up? Are they using it? Or like, because if it's not turning up in pawn shops, no one's walking into Guitar Center with a guitar saying here. Yeah. Well, they, you know, I, I can tell you, you know, there are, um, we had serial numbers off everything just because, you know, we had done some, we had traveled to Canada, Canada mm -hmm. on the, on that tour. And, you know, you have to yeah. do a manifesto for that, for the border crossing. Oh, so sure. there were serial numbers. Pardon? 
I said, I'm very aware of that one. I've got to do the same thing. <laughs> yeah. For all you young musicians, here you go. Right. Write down your serial numbers. Um, and, you know, uh, when I was teaching, I, I, the, my last teaching gig, I teach on independently, but I also was working at Guitar Center a few days a week. Well, Guitar Center, um, you know, they do a four-day hold on anything they buy that's used. It and it's a... Days. Pardon? I, I thought it was 30 days. It's only four? I think it's, I think it's four. Is, well, you got to remember, I'm in Champaign, Illinois, so it's not a huge... Okay. I mean, there's there's theft everywhere. Yeah. But you're not doing huge used business, you know. I got maybe you. a few things for a week, and it's, so it doesn't really take them as long. If you're in Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, something like that, yeah, you're going to want those thirty days. Yeah. Um, but for for champagne, it's a quicker search. Um, so yeah, they do a hold on it and they do in reverb, any, any company that takes used stuff, they'll do, uh, search searches. I believe, I think pawn shops are re required to whether or not they do is a different story. Yeah. I don't, yeah. yeah. Pawn shops. I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, you know, um, in our case, they're, you know, nothing has really happened. Yeah. To be honest, though, I mean, yeah, the the work I put into it was a little bit of a bummer. And it's a drum set that I've had for over 15 years. But uh, I was also like, hey, new drum set time. <laughs> so <laughs> you're like, you'll never guess what happened. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, I mean, you know, there's some, you know, I kind of, I like building stuff. So I'm going to, you know, hack up another curved icon rack and see what I can do with that. And, you know, we'll have to see what happens. I mean, there's, you know, I just, that reminds me, I got to email Pearl. Remind you that. And, and saving, but I mean, yeah, between the two bands, we just, we lost so much and you know, it's a, it's a drag. There's a, it's years of getting that stuff and working on it yourself and then getting it to work together, you know, and, and it's part of the show. So yeah, it's a little bit, it was a little bit heartbreaking. Uh, I, I, I can't even imagine that like, mm -hmm. I would be devastated if anything ever happened to to my stuff like that um one i guess one last thing i can i we can chat about before this starts getting into like one of these three hour you know shows <laughs> uh so you guys had the record come out uh this summer you did this big uh fantastic tribute tour um all last year and uh I'm trying to remember i think one of my friends was one of the opening acts on that tour at one point too um, who was it isn't it Wednesday 13? Didn't he do some dates with you? Yeah. Guys? Yeah. Uh, he did the, he did every show. Oh, he almost did every show. He did yeah. The, okay. he, they were, I think they dropped off. They went clear up to like the last week in December. But other than that, the, you know, oh, okay. Europe, okay. Australia, I they did all of it. Sure, um, how, how long he was out with you guys for. So, yeah. Um, so, all right. So you had the, the big, um, the reunion tour thing. I, well, I, I got like two questions I got to ask. One, <laughs> feel free. <laughs> I one, because I'm just curious about this stuff. Like I said, it's probably been published. I probably, if I Googled enough, could find all the answers to these. But you and I are meeting for the first time and I'm enjoying a conversation. So um, <laughs> it's what I'm here for. Uh, I, I'd like to know what it was like. Like when you first got the phone call of like, hey, let's get the band back together and and do this tribute to Wayne's legacy um what was your initial reaction and how did how did your how did you come to be involved like did you just get a phone call from one of the other guys saying hey i got this idea or was there 
other forces behind it or, or like I, I'm curious to know your side of it when when that first happened yeah you know it it kind of goes back to uh, we were always we were an unusually close band I know every band says oh we're like brother mm -hmm. um in in our case we kind of were you know other than Tony, I mean, Koichi and I, Koichi and Wayne and I were, we were a little bit older than when we got signed. You know, we were, I was 31 and Koichi's a year younger than me. Wayne's a year older. Um, <clears throat> and so, and we were all very family oriented. Um, so, uh, you know, there was this this closeness of the band. So Tony and I, after I was gone in, after I left in 2003, I just stayed away from it. Um, they had their business, I had mine, you know, there was stuff to do. And I had moved away from the music industry. I was still, I was teaching. And I think it was about 2010, Tony was in Soulfly at the time. And he was playing about an hour and a half from here. And okay, well, prior to that, probably 2000, summer 2009 or early 2010, to, you know, Wayne did this kind of crazy reunion tour thing where he was the only original member. And yeah. Tony texted me then. And he said, are you doing a reunion tour? I'm like, what are you talking about? And, but that was when we made contact and I was still on, I'm not a social media guy. So, but I was still on Facebook at the time. And, you know, around the time of the, earthquake and uh, tsunami in Japan, um, Koichi and I had made contact again through Facebook and had exchanged numbers and were talking. So, so we were talking, but only as, you know, kind of rekindling these friendships. Um, and it was text, you know, it was every couple of months or whatever. So, um, but then, you know, I went and saw Tony in person face to face in 2010. And then I, I had seen him again. You know, we had, we had made this contact and, and reestablished. I didn't bother him. I mean, the guy, you know, he was playing for everybody <laughs> at the time. And Koichi had things he was doing. So, um, I don't know. I mean, you know, after the fact, after Wayne dying, we talked about it and, and we, we've all mentioned in interviews, I think there was still some hope there. But, you know, you saw interviews those last couple of years of Wayne's life. I mean, th there would have had to have been some changes because, you know, he was going through something. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that because we had the hope that the band would reunite, that you have to have hope that somebody's going to come out of something like that or, you know, but then um, when he died, it wasn't a consideration. We started talking a lot more then just to support each other through you know because it it was you know just it, it's a hard thing to deal with and you know um a couple of years went past we hadn't talked about it at all i mean prior to wayne's dying tony and i had cracked a couple of jokes but that was it 
And then um, three years, almost three years after Wayne had died, I worked, I worked on a Sunday for some reason. I was teaching. Couldn't tell you why, because normally I don't I teach work on Sunday. So it doesn't seem out of the ordinary. <laughs> okay. Well, and, and so I, I came home from work and I, I walk in the house and I get this text from Tony that says, I just sent you an email with a song. And I was like, okay, well, I've been teaching, I'm playing a lot, I'm in shape. I could, if he wants me to record something for him, sure, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, get on the computer, open the song, and it's Push It. <laughs> and I'm like, You're like, I know this one already. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I listened to the whole song. I didn't sound any different to me. So I, I call Tony. I'm like, Dude. I'm very familiar with the song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why? <I> that one. <laughs> yeah, why? I mean, you aren't going to believe this, but I still get paid from that song. And he's like, that's our new lead singer. And that, and that was the start of it. So wow. he had, you know, he and Zero had made contact with each other. And Zero had re-recorded the song with his vocal. And I kind of got cold chills from it. I, and that was, you know, that was the beginning of it. Um, there were still some other hurdles. I, I had a, a rare form of the flu in January of 2018. I lost 95% of the hearing in my right ear. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I have a, I have a, I don't know if you can see it, but uh -huh. I have a, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, let me come closer. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. You yeah. Have a, you I have a chip in your head. Yeah, it's a, it's a, an abutment for. I'm a robot. Yeah, you're a cyborg, <laughs> dude. Yeah. How fitting. I'm bionic that too. <laughs> yeah. So, um, not that drummers need holes drilled into our heads. We got enough. Yeah. But, um, you know, I have a hearing aid, I, I can just hop on that. And that's, you know, that's a, the conductor bone. So um, that was how they fixed my hearing. Like opening my head to like crazy medical science that I wasn't even aware of right now. Yeah, it's, pre it's pretty cool. Well, then they, they've got one that it's a, like a plate and it's a magnet. And they could do that. And that's what they recommended at first. But I said, you know, look, I'm a, I'm a drummer. And next year, I'm supposed to be going on tour. Hopefully, you know, I didn't, we were still, I think we had done, we were getting ready to do the announcement. And, um, but my surgeon had grown up in recording studios. He ran sound for his church. He was a guitarist. And he said, uh, I know that they recommended this, that the doctors recommended this. I'm gonna recommend this other one. This is the one you wanna go with. Um, and so, yeah, it's really cool. So it's a little thing. I just pop it on my head and, and uh, the drawer that holds the battery, that's the on off switch. So I push the battery in, it gives me a warning. It's Bluetooth, I run it through an app on my phone. Your head is wired to your phone with Bluetooth. This I can I can literally Bluetooth a click track into my head. This is insane. Yeah. The downside to it, while the abutment is waterproof, mm -hmm. and I should have a, there's a little cap that goes out of it, but I lost mine. Um, the, I can't, the, I can't use it live because it's not waterproof. It's slightly water resistant, but they believe that I'll, and it's kind of an expensive gadget really, but um, yeah, it's pretty cool. And I've actually, I've done stuff before where I like using iPods, the old iPod classic. Don't yeah. know why it's my favorite thing. Me too. 
yeah, that's just, I mean, I've got my music on every computer and phone and iPad and everything, but there's, there's something about having an iPod where it's, it's solely dedicated to music. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. So, um, I, I was able to, I wish I could remember how I did this, but I, I think I hooked it up the iPod up to a computer and then I, the, or my iPad. And then I, I uh, was able to Bluetooth the click track off the iPad into my head <laughs> with headphones on. This is crazy. Yeah, it was a wow. slur. I've, I've tried some, some, it's pretty cool. The only bad thing is like, if I'm, if I'm driving and I'm using uh, my phone for directions, mm -hmm. um, if I've got Siri on, on my phone, uh, and it also syncs up to my car. So if I get directions, it will actually Bluetooth into my head and nobody else can hear it, but Siri will be talking inside my head. Well, that's a, if I, if I would have it on right now, mm -hmm. um, uh, I, the entire conversation we would be having, I would hear all your questions in my head. God, that's crazy. It is absolutely crazy. You're like <laughs> being able to blink and turn your car on. Like that's the next evolution. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I, I think Elon Musk is working on that. You know, they did. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure. Oh my God. Well, they just, they showed that thing. They implanted it in a, in a pig. Oh, I don't know that they've done it in humans yet. I heard talk yet. about it, but I didn't, I didn't know that they had tried stuff with it yet already. Yeah. They've, they've, I think they've only done, and I mean, it's, you know, <laughs> it, it's a little, and trust me, when Siri comes up in your head to give you directions, it kind of freaks you out a little bit. Oh my God, I can't you know, be driving and be like, what the? Yeah. Turn. And <laughs> well, and if I'm, if I'm using my phone and I go to speaker phone mm -hmm. um, and I've got the, the hearing device in, it actually won't come out of the phone speakers. It'll actually go into the device. If the Bluetooth is on. Oh my God. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. That's well, and I, I'm, I have concerns. I just hooked up, um, I've got a, I just put in a new garage door and a garage door opener. Yeah. It was on Wi Fi. And so I had to put a Wi Fi range extender. My garage is a part for my house. Mm -hmm. And I put a Wi Fi range extender on. But I had to make sure that everything in the garage was Bluetooth. So now I'm getting kind of concerned my garage door opener is going to talk to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> start opening and closing in the middle of the freaking out. Oh my God. Wow. That's yeah. so crazy. I, I didn't even know yeah. technology existed. That's wild. And you are. You're well, like a cyborg at this point. It's. <laughs> And it was something that Wayne and I always used to joke about because he'd be like, it'd be really cool if we could put like a eighth inch plug in your head. Now I have I one. kind of do. You, you're you basically one step removed from that where it's just Bluetoothing the click to your head. Yeah. Oh I, I kind of, I mean, I don't want anything to happen to my hearing, but I kind of want one on the other side just to match. Because like we were talking about the OCD thing. Like the Frankenstein know? bolts, you need one on each side. and Yeah, but since they're not here, it's a little more aerodynamic. <laughs> <laughs> it would look like I have exhaust. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's a great conversation piece, too. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Wow. If only I could, I could get LEDs around it or something. What was that dude in Star Wars that had the, the it looked like he had a headband around the back of his head? Yeah. You remember he was on the, he was, wasn't he a pilot for the, one of the Star Destroyers? Uh, he, no, he worked with the guy I'm talking about. He was, it was in the Empire Strikes Back and he was like Lando's 
half human, half cyborg right. bodyguard dude. Yeah. I, I can't remember his name, but he had something like that where Lando like activated him with a thing on his watch and it, and it mm -hmm. was on. Right? Well, and I, I think if I had, I use um, Garmin watches. I just, I really like them. I like how they look and everything. I like their, you know, cause they're, they're just really handy to use. If I used an Apple watch, I probably could you pair, more. You definitely pair a watch to your head. Yeah. Well, I can run music off my Garmin though. So yeah, I could probably Bluetooth music into my head. <laughs> <laughs> off my watch. Wow. That's so crazy. That's so crazy. <laughs> well, and, and I mean, to, you know, to answer your question, yeah, there were, you know, there were hurdles. So, you know, my dad, um, he's in practically in remission, but he has cancer and my parents were infirmed and there was a lot of doubt about doing it. I mean, when, you know, when writing was being done and I, I didn't get this in until September or October of 2018. And two and a half weeks after I had my surgery, I was in, I flew to Los Angeles to shoot an announcement video, you know, over a weekend and everything. And, and I still hadn't recovered from the effects of the surgery yet. Yeah. So I think there was probably, or I know for a fact that you guys had their doubts, but I'm, I'm also, you know, I'm pretty driven. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty hard on myself and everything. And so, you know, I came back and I taught for a couple more months and, and got past the beginning of uh, 2019. And then I just stopped everything and started working out and playing every day and building a drum set. And, you know, by the time uh, May rolled around, which was really when we started pre-production, um, Koichi and Tony and I, just wanted to be in a practice space together for a while mm -hmm. because it had, and to play the old stuff, you know, we worked on stuff, but it wasn't, we hadn't played anything except for like bled for days and push it. Mm -hmm. And once we got back in, once we got into the practice space, it felt like we had thrown back to 25 years ago, you know, when, when those songs were first written and about 30 seconds in, we were like, yeah, we're gonna be okay. This wow. is, that quick you know, it, it clicked that fast. You know, the, we're so close that the relationships never left, you know, um, but it was, you know, just a way to reconnect. And, and so we, we rehearsed on our own, no zero, for a month, maybe a little longer. I, I prefer that. I like that better where you rehearse without your vocalist for a while and tighten up the rhythm and get that in place mm -hmm. first. I, I used to, when I was younger, I used to hate that. I was always like, we need the singer because so many people- It's cute. Off, yeah, so many people cue off the vocals um, and they shouldn't because they should be queuing off of each other because the singer is going to be the first guy to screw up. So yeah, um, I I try to always teach my students don't listen to the lyrics when you're learning the song. Listen mm -hmm. to the bass player. Listen to this guitar riff here. Listen to you know count the bars in the verse or whatever it is, and ignore the vocals as much as you can because that's going to be the first person to get sick and not be able to perform. The first person to. <laughs> 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 uh, show up late or not show up at all to a rehearsal or what, whatever the situation is, it's going to be that person. <laughs> <laughs> well, and they, you know, they're the, for the most part, they're the most active person in the band because they're not tied down like everybody else is. Well, yeah. I mean, 
Um, but yeah, I mean, the rest of it <laughs> applies, <laughs> you know. Um, there are reasons there are lead singer's disease jokes. <laughs> oh, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> you know, and we will fully admit, I, I've joked for years, you know, hey, you know, I'm beating on an inanimate object with a stick. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I, I get my part of it. Oh, but oh. yeah, lead, lead singers, you always cue. And I mean, I'm still, yeah, I'm tied to the click, mm -hmm. but the, I still cue off what Tony and Koichi are doing. Yeah. You know, that's still, oh, okay. I know, and, and when you play the same thing night after night after night, you know, I'm 54 years old. You, you go into a brain fog. It's got to be muscle memory, but you still have moments where you're like, man, where am I in this song? I've only played it for 25 years, but you know, I know the rest of the song enough that, oh, that's okay. Now I know where I'm at. Koichi yeah. or Tony will do something. Um, yeah, that's a that's a big help. You, I, I I like it for just that band connection too. I mean, just the there's a, a reconnect, you know, and we've all got our own lives. I mean, you know, Tony's, um, Tony takes care of his, helps take care of his parents. He's got sisters, you know, Koichi has a son. Um, you know, we all have jobs and so just getting back together with, you know, the three of us, uh, that just feels important. And to, while we talk on the phone, there's, you know, there's that being face to face where you just kind of reconnect and th that's always a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely mm -hmm. it is. Um, what do you, well, I mean, this year has been kind of a wash for everybody. You guys did release the record, um, albeit delayed like everybody else's was. I, yeah. Like, July happened to be like the record release month. Everybody I know had records come out in July. I had two come out in July and they were all supposed to be earlier in the year. And the yeah. label just was like, oh, wait a minute. We don't know what's going on. We're going to sit on this one for a little while until they just couldn't sit on it any longer. So we got to put it out. Mm -hmm. um, what, what was your original plan for this year, knowing that that record was going to come out? And has it shuffled to... 2021 or some people are even going beyond that now and being like oh maybe like fourth quarter 21 um what were you well i i mean yeah i just read a couple of days ago that uh, uh, there's a group of scientists around the world that had said because of uh the measures that everybody acted that we may see this thing you know um be at its lowest ebb in uh, by midsummer 2021. It's kind of um, too. Yeah. Um, well, and I, I think it's important that, you know, there are, well, uh, once a virus is on this planet, there's no getting rid of it. It just, it's here. So we are going to have to figure out how to, to live with it and watch out for each other and everything. I think we, uh, you know, pretty much most of our, uh, we're working on 2021 20, right now because it, it just, well, and, and because everybody had other projects, um, while I have, I've, since I got back from our show in Ringle, uh, I haven't played drums but I've been doing other projects and I've done some programming for a couple of friends and mm -hmm. um, Tony had an Assassino album to write and, you know, every, everybody had side projects. So I think it just became important to, you know, while Ringo was a great opportunity, you know, bands play shows. Yeah. <laughs> And um, 
because of the way the Ringle show was done, um, was the reason we did it was just to play. I mean, it was, you know, it was 20% capacity. It was outdoors. Um, you know, the, the downside is, you know, there was no hanging out. I mean, Koichi and Tony and I went on stage, played, and then got in the car and left, you know, but it, it was, it was in the middle of a field and, and it was also the county, Marathon County, Wisconsin. At that time, they'd had two cases, I think. Oh, wow. Yeah, something, or no, they'd had 11, 11 cases and one death. Okay. And that was from February to July. So, wow. yeah, so that, that was like, okay, this is okay to do. But other than that, it, you know, it became patently obvious that, you know, we needed to kind of push everything to 2021. Mm -hmm. um, the album was so greatly received that um, we ended up doing a lot of press. So it's not like I wasn't busy during that time. You know, we had, we had a little bit of press to do every day, which was really cool. Um, we did, uh, you know, we did some signings. We, you know, kind of shipping hasn't been great, <laughs> but we did a couple of, of limited presses and um, we also autographed like, I don't know, 10,000 CDs, <laughs> you know? So those, all that stuff got shipped and that kind of took a while. So we've, we've had stuff to do. We've had, it wasn't, sitting around waiting and and um uh you know we all got to work on different kinds of music too so but yeah it's we're working on stuff for 2021 we're also um you know we'll have to see about volume two mm -hmm. um you know who knows everything's become so and you're doing this so you understand it too it's like you always had goals in the music industry, but you know, if you planned on 10 things, you counted on 80% of it going right, and then 20% was gonna go haywire, but you dealt with it. Well, now the music industry's changed so much that you've got, really got about 20% you can count on, and the other 80% is chaos control, you know, crisis control. Um, <laughs> Very and, much. And, yeah, and it's so, and everything has become a in the now proposition. Yeah, we're working on 2021. No, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> I know, I mean, you know, it's look at, I think, you know, I would have loved to have played uh, Welcome to Rockville again, and they just announced their bankruptcy. I mean, that's really, that's, a, that's heartbreaking. That was such a great festival. Yeah, there there's so many uh, festivals that are just not happening anymore, and yeah. stuff that's been getting pushed. There, I mean, I saw so many festival announcements that in the spring that people were getting excited about, and it would say July or August or whatever. And then you look at the date, really small, and it says twenty one, and you're like, ah, they got me. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But well, and, and we were going to do limited touring this year. I think we only had shows planned in the United States, but I think probably around three, three and a half months total of shows counting um, stuff in Europe, Ukraine and Russia, you know, we were going to do some, some, but we were going to do some, some European festival stuff. And it was like, yeah, guess not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. It's, it's weird. I just, uh, just yesterday, there was an announcement. Uh, I'm going to be doing a festival in Europe, but it's next. It's actually one year away. It's this coming weekend, a year from now. And I'm like, well, I hope they open borders in the next 12 months because that's going to determine on whether or not I can go. <laughs> yeah, set a reminder on your phone. Right. Exactly. <laughs> one year from now. Get out of the um, yeah. But it's it's a 
we're the same one, but I think that there's been a couple of announcements on uh, Twitter and Facebook. You know, we're doing, there's been a, a couple of festivals, but it is next summer. All of it's been next summer. Everybody I've talked to that is in like the regular touring circuits and stuff like that, next summer, all next summer. Yeah. And that's like at best next summer because the yeah. post keeps getting moved back and stuff like that. There's been some places, pockets here and there that have been doing shows recently. Like you guys did yeah. in July where you, you went to Wisconsin in July. Um, I just got back from from Baltimore doing a couple of dates there. And I can tell you those, they social distancing is not a thing there. <laughs> the the only people that i saw the end we were there we were out east for five days last week and the only people that i saw with masks on regularly was the band um <laughs> well and it's i i personally i it, you know we got to watch out for each other <laughs> yeah. yeah and again my 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 dad has cancer so, and he just had uh, surgery, he had a spot on his head removed. So, you know, it's, yeah. I do a lot of hand washing and mask wearing. Yeah, you're absolutely <laughs> right. I, I just got my test this morning, my COVID test this morning. Um, because right when I got back from, from doing the shows on the East Coast, I had uh, a couple of shows here and I've got a couple more coming up over the next couple of weeks. And it's, like I've all of a sudden started playing shows again, um, all outside of LA County, nothing in LA, it's all out of town. But um, because I've been around groups of people recently, I'm yeah. like, you know what? Better call the doctor <laughs> just to yeah. be on the safe side. And uh, my mother's in the same situation that your father is. Mm -hmm. And um, I was, uh, she's in North Carolina. Okay. And I had like a massive layover on a flight there for like three hours. And she was, she wanted to drive to the airport so she could visit. And I was like, mom, I've been trapped in metal tubes in very <laughs> all day today with strangers. I don't know. Yeah. You're in what we call the high risk category. <laughs> yeah. As much as I want to see you sit this play out and We'll, we'll revisit it when it's a little bit safer and I got a little bit better control on my surroundings. Yeah. So. Well, and I, I think, you know, just from the, I'm interested in the scientific standpoint of it. And I, I think, you know, from what I've read that it, it just mutates so fast that, you know, yeah, I'm like a, maybe I'm protecting somebody if I have the mask on and, you know, I don't know. I'm a, I'm a simple kind of guy. So, you know, it's just like, I hear uh, you. yeah, I don't, um, you know, I don't really want to sit on a plane for 12 hours with a mask. On. <laughs> it is a little bit, it's it like when you get to the hotel and you finally can take it off because you're not in a car with somebody who just picked you up from the airport or whatever it is or a cab. You take it off when you finally get to the hotel or get home or whatever. It is like, oh my god, okay. It's like the most leaving <laughs> thing ever. Um, but I, I understand. I get it. It was like, all right, if I want to go do this thing that I or if I have to go do this thing, whatever it's going to be. If this is what I got to do, if these are the hoops that I got to jump through to do it, I'll yeah, deal. I'll deal. But same. I'm the same way. It's you know, um, if we can we can do this, and you know, uh, Illinois has got. <clears throat> we're not as restricted as as L.A. County, but there's some parts of Illinois where it's it's restricted and not open. And you know, my feeling was is, well, if I wear a mask and that is brings us a step closer to reopening i'm all for that yeah exactly you know? and and yeah. yeah i i'm i'm with you there and 
So my masks are all stylish. I have a bunch of, you know, if I got to wear one, you, it might as well look good, you know? Yeah. It's a horror movie. I've got <laughs> I've got some good ones. I'm, I I never played hockey, but I got a really cool kind of hockey mask. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, I have my Sabres one that I'm, I'm waiting for the NHL season to start back up, and I got my Sabres one for that. Right now with football, I got my Bills mask that I've been wearing. <laughs> <laughs> Does it, is it like the... No, <laughs> no, that's cool. That's really cool. No, it's it's just got the logos and and like pictures of the helmet on it and stuff. But that would be cool if it actually looked like a grill from a, a football helmet. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be awesome. That would be really cool. I wonder. I'm gonna have to look now and see if they got ones like that. That'd be. <laughs> I I know they pretty much everything else. Um, the only thing with masks, I have to I have to wear ones that have adjustable loops on my ears because if i wear anything that goes around my head i can't wear my hearing device at all oh, yeah, yeah you got the yeah the, the chip there it, yeah. it it gets caught on it so uh -oh. that's okay. kind of a drag <laughs> so when you're playing live are you using in-ears i use in-ears um and the cool thing about it you know we uh all use ultimate ears I was just going to, I was like, I got mine right here, except for, for getting that really <laughs> Well, me, and, and I use, um, I use uh, just sure uh, 325s for my own practices. Okay. Um, and just with the old yellow sponges. Oh, I, those, yeah, I remember those. Yeah, <laughs> those work, but they work really well. And they've got pretty good bass response, but with the ultimate ears live, um, and the other guys are, you know, they're on packs. Mm -hmm. I'm actually hardwired. Yeah, I do. And um, yeah, it, well, you're, I don't need to stand up and walk around with it. I can have a cable, you know. Yeah, well, and that's the thing is, you, you know, I'll, I'll, I may, I got the, you know, ultimate ears does the one that's like you can get it what like a foot longer or something for oh yeah yeah drummers? for cable ones yeah yeah i went ahead and got that and um but the ultimate ears the weird thing about it is when i've got those in the the channel is so long on the on the part that inserts into the ear canal that i actually hear somewhat with that that's good and yeah, it's it's a strange thing. We were in um, last year. I think we were in might have been Birmingham, England, and um, you know my my wire crapped out like they all do, mm -hmm. um, and my drum tech was switching it. But the the weird thing about it was, um, you know, my left ear went out. Uh, the click went out, but I could with those ultimate ears, I could still hear a little bit. I was getting click. Wow. So I had to, you know, I had to kind of drop down the velocity a little bit because it it is muffled. But yeah, I can I can hear really good with ultimate wow. ears. Pretty cool. I just got a new set yeah. um recently. I I the ones I had had, I'd had them for Oh my God, almost 10 years at this point. And they still fit perfectly fine. They still were great. And I was just, this year I was like, you know what? I, I'm going to, they were like the base model, like the, the least expensive ones you can get that were molds. Right. And they worked fine because nine times out of 10, I just got a click feed and threw them anyway. So yeah. I don't need to click in nine different frequencies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I decided I've been doing this year, I've been doing way more recording sessions than I ever have before because it's kind of all you could do. Um, so I decided to up my ears and get like the most expensive ones. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, if I'm doing studio stuff and I, you know, I'm really focusing on that, I want to be able to hear everything. I want to be able to hear if there's a tension rod rattling on the bottom of my floor tom yeah. in that take, you know? So I got the new ones and they uh, they did the laser scan this time instead of like injecting yeah. 
and they didn't quite fit, and I had to have them remolded like twice, and they still didn't fit right. Really? Yeah, it was weird. So what I did is I sent them my old ones, and I said, oh. just scan those. So, yeah. So they did that, and then when I got the new ones back, they fit like a glove because they fit just like the old ones. And now I can hear everything so clear. I used them live for the first time last week, and I was like, Oh my God, it actually feels like my kick. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> oh, so you got the ones the you know, they came out. I think that was like a year and a half ago. They came out with the, the ones that are solely for drummers and bass players. Those are the ones that I got. got like, They're yeah, the 11. seven drivers. Yep. <laughs> yeah, those are the ones well, I and the, got. Well, and see, I was skeptical. We had done, you know, we all... I was using, when we first started touring, in-ear, in-ear technology was out, but it was very, I, I sweat so much, and sure had the, they had a $99. They still uh, um, Yeah, they still have the $99, okay. but they're, they're, it's a lot better now. Ah. At this time, it was, it was okay. It didn't have any kind of hard wires or anything. It was just kind of flimsy Hmm. wound cables that you just looped around your ear, but it wasn't form fit. Okay. Um, But I, even with the sponges and everything on, (laughs) I sweat so much that I would go through, I was going through, you know, like a set of those a month. Jeez. Well, at Target at the time, they had these rubberized kind of earbud things that you bought them for $19. So I would go buy four or five sets of those at a time. And that's what I used. I would I would use the Shures for long riding sessions. And then I would use the $19 because if I sweated them out, I was just like, ah. Eh, Take the earpieces off, throw out the that's the in ear. That's so funny. My the first time I decided I wanted to try to use some sort of in ear live, those were the ones mm-hmm. I got. Was the one yeah. the the ones from Target that had the rubber that kind of went around your ear. Yeah. I got yep. those just to try it out and see what it was like. And I used those for a little while. And then I got a set of ultimate ears that were like the universal fit ones, the ones like the Shures that anyone could wear. Yeah, yeah. And I had those and I used those for quite a few years until um, I decided to upgrade and get molds done. Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, the the very first time I was ever like, you know what, instead of using this wedge blasting me in the face, (laughs) I use headphones. And tried to listen to everything that way, and then I could start playing with the click better and everything else. And so, yeah, I just mm-hmm. used like, the cheap ones from Target, you know, back yeah. in 2002 or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, and for for me, by the time 2002, 2002, I actually was using. We had gotten our our first. We had, um, oh, I can't remember the model number, but we had gone we spent the money and you know at the time you know now everybody does like a scan or Mm -hmm. you know we actually had to go to an appointment with an ear doctor (laughs) and they injected the silicone into your ears and everything And, and the whole process by the time you got your rubberized molds and everything excuse me, you got the rubberized molds and everything. It was like $3,500. It was a fortune. And those things, you know, I mean, I still have my set. um, And uh, I use them to practice on. They were the, at the time, they were the best thing you can get. But now, you know, the $99 Shures are probably... Um, more effective than those $3,500. But I was, you know, by 2002, I was actually, you know, we all went wireless and I was up on the huge drum riser then. So it was like, eh, it's easier, you know? Uh, yeah. And, but uh, 
but the ultimate ears i'm i'm a pretty big fan of those and they um you know because of all everything i went through with the the surgery and all the ear exams and everything um getting my ear scanned and sitting there for that was no big deal to me <laughs> yeah. it was weird i was like oh hey my ears are hot yeah <laughs> and that was that was it you know i was a little surprised that they got warm but um yeah i haven't had any issues with them and yeah absolutely love them i don't know if it was a weird scan or what happened i don't know they they actually came right here and did it here i sat right here behind oh my... yeah oh well see we actually uh went there oh. but we were we were i think we were in like full-on pre-production at the time so we were at SIR or Third yeah. Encore, whatever the studio. That's a, I think you walk across the parking lot. Yeah, that's that's over at Third Encore, I think, right? Yeah, that's that's just down so, the street from here. It's not far, a couple miles away. Oh, okay. Um, but they, what it was is the the rep um, hit me up, and they happened to be going to a church to like scan a whole church band that was in this area and i was like oh my studio's right over there and they're like well we can just swing by on our way back to the office and and grab your new molds for you and i was like oh okay so they came right here and had this mobile like briefcase thing that they opened up and it had a computer. that's what i was wondering yeah so it was like this whole mobile they looked like a cooler you know it looked like a beer cooler <laughs> and i just sat here on my throne and they they just and they're like yeah just sit there and i was like okay they did the thing and scanned it and i could watch they had a laptop open and in real time it was showing the scan of my ear happen which was yeah so cool. it was awesome well, well and i don't think people understand that like your ears everybody ears are like their fingerprint yeah like you know it's it's kind of unique to you and it doesn't match from side to side you can't just yeah you know, Right. Oh, I lost this one. I'll just flip this one. No, it exactly. doesn't work that way. Yeah, exactly. Um, but that's pretty cool that they. Yeah. Okay. Here's your ear scan. <laughs> nice house call. It was nice. <laughs> that was very good. awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, man, we've been we've been at this for a couple hours at this point, <laughs> um, and you're you're on uh, a different time zone, so I know it's already later for you and stuff like that. So we. Uh, if you're cool, we could probably just wrap this up here. Yeah, is that work for you? Sure. Awesome. Sure. Uh, yeah, I should. I should probably uh, grab a snack. Yeah, it's, <laughs> you go home and make dinner, and and what time is it there? Like ten, right now. Uh, quarter after. Quarter after. Quarter after ten. So, yeah, it's already mm -hmm. getting late over there for you. So, uh, dude, it's been an absolute pleasure meeting you. It's been great. Uh, getting to, to sit down and chat and do this. Thank you very much for doing this. Um, it's really just been my way of connecting and hanging out with other drummers. And like I said, most of them were just personal friends. And then I've just recently started branching out to like people I don't know, but but know only in like, I've seen them, I've listened to their music I, or whatever it is. And um, now branching out to, to those people and just making the community larger kind of thing. Yeah. So, thank uh, you so much. Awesome. thank you so much for having me. You know, it's it's um, not just me, but as a band, we're just we're so kind of really humbled and honored that people want to hear us. You know, and it it was like such a uh, overwhelming experience last year that you know we're we're getting to the point where we're we're ready to go back out. Um, it was such a cool experience and, and it was my pleasure to do this. I, I appreciate it. Thanks for any time you need me to talk, man. I'm here. I know that's, that's great. That's really great to hear and stuff like that. And I, you know, I, I love just talking drums and chatting with other drummers and stuff. And it's, it's because drummers are the coolest people we get together and we hang out. You never see a bunch of bass players hanging out together. Right. So, <laughs> well, and we're we're competitive but we're not lead guitarist competitive it's like right man like, how does he do that it's like oh don't look at the settings on my amp those are my settings 
And <laughs> drummers were more like, dude, let me talk about this. Check out this thing that I just found out about, you know? And we, <laughs> yeah. our conversation was that today about, yeah. you know, oh, have you used this mic mount for your bass drum? Oh, what about your inner? It's like, yeah. it's, it's not, it, it's a different kind of competitive where it's more like, how much fun can we have or something? I don't yeah. Know, but like, well, and I, for me, I mean, you know, uh, when you're younger, I would tell you when I was in cover bands, when I was a teenager and then probably into probably about mid twenties when I, when I thought I was serious about it. I, or the neck guy, or man, that guy, that man, I don't want to like that guy. But then by the time you get serious about it, you start realizing that guy that's better than me, I can learn. If I just, if I pay attention or if I talk to him, if he'll talk to me, you know, there's, there's something to be said for that. But, and, you know, um, I joke about it. Koichi is not Koichi's not competitive like that. Koichi wants to learn so much that I'll just say he's got a drummer's heart. <laughs> <laughs> that that frames it nicely. That I yeah. I completely understand what you mean when you say something like that. You know? Yeah. And it's like what you said. There, you know, when I was growing up listening to my favorite records, stuff like that, you you mentioned like Tempest on Astro Creep and stuff. And oh. I would listen to that and I'd be like, what is that snare drum? How does he get that sound? I want that to be my sound. I like, and you just, then you get to a point where you're just like, well, I'll just ask him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> where <you're> like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, where were the mics? Where, I know you where your snare mics were. Where were the room mics? Right. What snare did you use? What strainers do you have? That's exactly it. Now, now it's to, you know, you get to this place that where you're just like, oh, well, I've been looking for this thing. You know who I know has one of those or used that? Let me call him and get his opinion on it real quick. Yeah. <laughs> no? Yeah. yeah. Oh, awesome, man. Well, thank you. You have a good night. Um, you too. I'm going to have this uploaded in the next couple weeks. So like I do this um, every second and fourth Tuesday of the month. And okay. They're all pre-taped. So um, this one will be the first one in, in November. So whatever the second week of November is. Okay. Is, is when I'll put this one up on YouTube and I'll I'll let your people know and stuff like that when it's up. And awesome. So. Great, man. Well, it's, seriously, it was, this was my pleasure. I really enjoyed it and if you need to, if you want to talk anymore, just let I, Tom you know. know. I, I, I've been considering doing a second round with some of the same people I've done that once I get to a certain point. Um, then I want to maybe start looping back around and just checking up. <laughs> you know what I mean? And being like, all right, we haven't chatted in, in a couple months. How are things now? How are you doing? Yeah. Now? You know what I mean? That, we'll probably do that's that. not a bad idea, actually. Yeah, yeah, kind of. Mm -hmm do that and then you know stage three of it would be once things are a little more socially acceptable and open and people can kind of interact a little bit more freely then it's like all right now let's just go to coffee and we'll stick yeah. the camera on the table <laughs> per that is perfect that is a great way to go that's what i used to do with with most of my friends anyway we'd go and we'd sit at a starbucks for two or three hours and talk about nerdy this new bass drum pedal that just came out or something like that <laughs> um and now for obvious reasons we just can't do that as freely i mean you can't even go to a coffee shop and sit down now um so you can barely go to music stores i i have been to pro drum a couple of times down on vine yeah like they were like at first they were super like keeping things on the dl where i they didn't look open, but I called and they're like, yeah, to the back door between this hour and that hour. And you know what you needed. I needed some drum heads for something. And they're like, yeah, we got those in stock. 
We'll have them waiting for you. Come to the back door between this time and this time. And I was like, it was super under the radar and stuff like that, which made it actually really cool. <laughs> <laughs> It's like your prohibition. Yeah, it was. It was for drum heads. <laughs> prohibition for drum heads is what it was. Because I was wearing it and they weren't open at the time. And I was like, oh, man, I really need to change heads for this session I got. And. So I called Pro Drum, like, yeah, we got you. We got you. You just got to come to the back door. <laughs> Knock three times, whistle right. twice. Yeah. I, I went to, in um, in July when I came out, I went to, you know, all manufacturing was shut down so much yeah. that I, I thought about, you know, calling up Vader for a box of sticks to, to play the Ringles show. And then I was like, no. They're probably shut down. I'll just go, you know, Guitar Center in, Holly in Hollywood is going to be open. I'll just go up there. Mm -hmm. And I, I went to, so, you know, I had to wait in a socially distanced line outside, you know, and everybody had their mask on. And then, you know, in the store, you everybody's got the plexiglass up and everything. And, and I was, um, and because manuf I didn't think about it, but because manufacturing had shut down, they only had a couple of pairs of of uh, fat back three A's, you know, nylon tips. And I was like, oh, you know, if if I can't get them from Vader Guitar Center's probably, mm -hmm. you know, they they just what they have right now, you know. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it was definitely it. Was, it was kind of like being in prohibition. It was. I was starting to sweat it with drumsticks for a minute because yeah. um, uh, I'm with Regal Tip and they were shut down for it. Yeah. You know, and I'm watching. You know, the shelf start to get lower and lower and lower. <laughs> I'm. I'm. I was playing every day. I was strapped to this kit eight hours a day, and I, I'm. I was very fortunate that um, I had a lot of recording session stuff coming across my plate because i can do it all remotely right here yeah and, but that also meant that i was blowing through heads and sticks <laughs> right. cymbal and pisties closed and i'm like oh my god oh my <laughs> what god. am i gonna do right now everything's breaking. <laughs> <laughs> well and it's you know i i think that everybody thinks that if only i would have prepared for this it'd be okay it's like how do you prepare for something like that you can't there is no possible way. No, you can't. So yeah, no. It, it's 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 weird. It's still weird. Yeah, it it's gonna be weird for a while, I think too. Yeah, yeah. Well, so. in any case, thank you again, man. I really appreciate your time. The, thank you, man. Is is seriously my pleasure. Uh, stay safe out there. Thank you. You too. And, uh, well, anytime you want to talk, give me a call. I absolutely will. Thank you. Okay, man.